G'day guys, how are you going? My name is Tech and welcome to my channel called Bootlosophy. I work and record on Wajuk country, Western Australia, and I acknowledge the traditional owners of this land. In today's video, I'm looking at the Parkhurst Richmond boot made up in Seidel's double shot leather. It's a combination tanned uh, and pump full of oils and waxes like Chrome Excel, but is it a more rugged leather? So this is the Parkhurst Richmond boot. It's a cat toe, six inch service boot pattern. And this makeup is in Seidel Tanning Corporation's double shot leather in a finish that's called Light Natural. Parkhurst, being a small batch manufacturer, has made the Richmond boot in a variety of makeups and continue to do so. Each makeup varies in the leather, of course, but Parkhurst also mixes it up by changing the design elements, like the backstay, for example. Uh, sometimes making it a single piece backstay, like in this model, and sometimes make it in a uh, double backstay format where there's a strip that runs up the shaft and a heel pocket backstay that covers the external heel counter. That's the heel stiffener underneath this here that gives the boot its shape at the heel. Other design changes uh, uh, from makeup to makeup may be a variation in the stitching at the toe cap. This one in a closely stitched double row, others in a triple stitch pattern, a single and double row of stitches and so on. Um, other variations with the type of hardware, brass, antique brass, or colored, uh, and varying the number of eyelet and speed hook combinations. Finally, Parkhurst will also mix up the soles. Dana, in this case, uh, sometimes they mix it up to Ridgeway or to its hide commander soles. It makes life interesting. Just before we go on, I wanted to look at this leather from Seidel that's called Double Shot. It's a relatively new development and only came out at the beginning of 2021. Rugged boot maker Truman only started producing boots using Double Shot in February 2021. In fact, I think they were the first uh, uh, to make boots in that leather. And then leather suppliers started offering Double Shot later that year. Seidel seems to have been playing with some pull-up leather crust um, that's leather that's been dried after tanning but not yet dyed. And they tried hot stuffing it with waxes and finishing it like a regular pull-up leather. What they've produced is something similar to Chrome Excel being hot stuffed with waxes and oils. It is definitely a pull-up leather uh, caused by infusing multiple hot wax processes into the leather and as you pull on it the fibers in the leather relaxes so that the waxes and oils move around underneath. A full grain leather that means it's uncorrected uh, not removing any pores, hair holes, other skin surface variations. Uh, uh, it feels smooth in the finish and really quite buttery. Chrome Excel is slightly corrected, so mostly gives a smooth and finished look and feel. Double Shot is more ruggedly unfinished, and the natural grain takes dye in uh, depth to produce natural variations of shade. Where the piece comes from a looser part of the animal, like near the belly which has been stretched and more elastic in life, you get some really interesting wrinkled contrast, like on this quarter of the boot here. This particular model is in light natural, which means it's not dyed, came quite light brown honey coloured, and it will darken as it has even now, and show variation even more as it patinas. Parkhurst is very adventurous in its leather selection, tending toward the rugged end of the spectrum, more Truman than Grant Stone in that spectrum. Uh, this leather suits Parkhurst's vibe perfectly. Moving on to talk about Parkhurst. They were started in 2018 by former stock analyst Andrew Savisco when he realized there was a poorly filled niche. Looking for boots, he found he had to choose between expensive well-made boots or cheap fashion brands. So he decided to make the great American boot in heritage service boot style, supporting American labor and businesses and producing quality made boots at a mid-range price. I said earlier Parkhurst is a small batch manufacturer. What that means is that they make small batches at a time. Once that batch of leather bought is used, they will move on to a new makeup and may or may not return to a particular makeup later. Uh, while they do make them on specific model platforms, the Capto Richmond or the Plainto Allen, uh, specific leathers may or may not be available from time to time. 
So for us as customers, it does mean that if you like a particular makeup, you need to buy it now because once it runs out, you may not see it again. Now, while that may be a disadvantage if you're still shopping and deciding, if you've already bought, it means that you've got yourself what is probably a pretty unique boot. Dealing with Parkers is also a great pleasure. I speak like it was a big company, but of course, it's actually a one-man band. Andrew does it all from designing lasts to closely involving himself in the manufacturer at contracted factories uh, to nailing on the heels himself to doing all the social media and website marketing. So if you contact Parkhurst, and you will be answered personally by Andrew. Customer service from him is excellent, and he provides very personal contact and service himself. Now let's look specifically at this makeup. The Richmond is a six inch cap toe service boot, meaning it's modeled after the boots worn by servicemen and women from the two world wars. This is built on Parkhurst's 602 last, which has been sleeked down from the real service boot designs to fit with a more modern aesthetic. A last is the usually wooden foot-shaped mold that the bootmaker pulls the upper leathers around to shape the boot. So what the last looks like is what the boot will eventually look like. Andrew designed the 602 last himself and named it after the number of the landing ship tank his grandfather served on. It's a combination last in that it starts at a narrow width at the heel and opens up to an E width at the ball of the foot. The toe is rounded to be more anatomically inclined than some sharply almond toe shaped lasts. So what you get is a pleasing heritage style shape that's also comfortable and very modern looking. The heritage service boot pattern combines with the natural colored double shot and the patina and variation that will evolve to present a rugged looking casual outdoorsy boot. So clearly you would pair it with casual gear and not dressy or business casual in any sense. Uh, if you disagree, you might want to take a look at my video on uh, my five best business casual boots to see how I define business casual up there. Uh, leaving aside business casual, I reckon this would work with any smart casual outfits, down the casual scale to good old t-shirt and jeans. On the smart casual side, I've worn it with chinos or five pocket pants, paired with uh, button up shirts, with or without a relaxed casual sports coat, or maybe a bomber or Harrington jacket. It even suits, I think, a little preppy style. Uh, maybe not the full-blown Harvard-Yale vibe, but white or pastel chinos and polo shirts would work with these. On the most part, I'd pair the matte tan honey color leather with earth tone colors like tans, browns, and greens. However, I think the tan aspects, at least until they darken with age, will be quite an attractive contrast with some of the dark neutral colors like black or dark gray under an all-black outfit, I think they would pop. Travelling down the rugged casual look, they would be perfect for rugged casual styles, jeans, check shirts, work shirts, or anything wax canvas. If you allow them to get a beat up a bit, uh, super casual and faded jeans and a t-shirt is fine. Okay, now, let's take a look at how they're constructed. As usual, I'll start from the bottom and go up. The outsole is a day-night sole. Not a proprietary product, but the real thing. Daynight is an English manufacturer of rubber outsoles, and they came up with this product in 1910. So it's not a modern design, even though it looks sleek and quite modern. The advantage of the Daynight studded sole is that it's quite thin, and so can look okay on a dressy boot or shoe. Yet at the same time, the studded design gives a reasonable grip in most places. The studs are actually quite low and inset into wells, so that it maintains that low profile and the wells help you to knock off dirt so that it doesn't stick and you can walk in and out of homes without leaving a trail of mud behind. Day night is actually pretty good for most of my use case scenarios uh, but just remember where I live there's no snow or ice. I wear my footwear mostly in urban situations, indoors for sure but also when I'm outdoors it's walking over parkland or the concrete jungle, uh, dry in summer or in the rain in winter. I have taken day-night salt boots for a walk in muddy and sandy forest reserves without problems, but they really excel in mostly town-based circumstances. Depending on the midsole and insole of boots, they can feel a bit thin underfoot, but the other side of the coin is that they give you a sureness of where you put your feet. Sitting above that is a full-length leather insole, about 3 mils thick. The rubber outsole is glued to this leather in, uh, midsole, and then both are sewn to the weld. 
A welt is used in this form of construction called Goodyear welted construction. A welt is a thin strip of leather that goes around the edge of the boot. Uh, the outside edge is sewn to the sole and the inside edge is separately sewn to the turned in uppers inside the boot. In this way, there is a stitch outsole uh, outside connecting the welt to the sole and a stitch inside connecting the welt to the uppers and neither shall pass between so that there are no stitch holes passing directly through the boot from inside to the outside, which in turn means that there's less chance of water wicking into the boots. It also means that when you wear out the Daynut rubber sole, you don't throw away the boots. You get them resold because it's easier to just undo the stitches, peel the outsole off, replace it, and sew the new one back on, all without even touching and possibly damaging the uppers. Heritage built is all about durability as well as slow fashion. This welt is in fact a variation of a simple flat welt. This is a split reverse welt. This is where the inside edge of the welt is split horizontally halfway to the outside edge. The bottom half of that split is sewn to the uppers as usual. The top half of that split is flanged upwards and pushed against the side of the boots, producing a raised lip for better water resistance. Also, uh, this welt is called a wheeled welt. Rather than a flat leather surface, the surface as if has been passed through a wheel that presses these corrugations into it for decoration and a little extra sturdiness. Now, if you think about it, putting a strip of leather about two mils thick around the edge of the boot, along with all the stuff it's sewn onto, will cause a well or cavity inside the bordering welt. In these boots, that cavity is filled by cork, and then on top of that, to smooth it out, is a leather insole. Uh, this is this Goodyear welting uh, leather plus cork plus leather construction is the gold standard. While it doesn't have the immediate comfort of, say, foam or pour-on like in the Thursday Captain, it's said that the leather-cork-leather leather combination will compress to the shape of your feet in time to give you bespoke, tailor-made comfort and certainly last longer. On top of this natural comfort, the arch support and stability is helped by the placement of a strong but flexible fiberglass shank into the cork bed. Inside, on the leather insole, is a leather half-length heel pad uh, or sock liner which gives you a little more comfort in the heel as well as protect your heels from the clinch nails that hold the, the uh, heels on. The heels are real stacked leather on the day-night layer and topped by a day-night rubber heel top lift for shock absorption and grip. Moving up, we've talked about the double shot leather. The panels, uh, vamp, toe cap, quarters and backstay sewn together with double and triple stitch uh, stitching. This is not a real toe cap. In this model, the toe cap is attached to the vamp piece and it's not an extra piece that's sewn on top of the vamp. The boot is unlined in the back and up the shaft and lined in the vamp and up to two, two and a half mil leather, uh, it's really heavy enough to feel sturdy without any lining. The toe and the heel is stiffened by Celastic. That's a thermoplastic that's shaped while warm and then stiffens to create shape in the toe and in the heel. The hardware is antique brass, goes very well with this tan color. All eight unbacked eyelets, no speed hooks. I don't mind that, although I do generally take the laces out of the first uh, one or two eyelets in order to get the boots on and off, and speed hooks usually help save a second or two. The tongue is semi-gusseted up to the fourth eyelet, so that helps with water resistance again, and it helps with keeping the tongue from slipping. The edges of the collar and the lace facings are unfinished, but there is a leather ring at the collar to reinforce it. Quality control is pretty good. All the stitches seem okay. A couple of loose stitches that I just leave there or I burn off, no biggie. The stitches look even and reasonably straight. Uh, this is a handmade boot, so I can overlook maybe some uh, slightly misaligned stitching. Uh, again, no biggies amongst this lot. The only uh, odd thing might be this inner quarter which I'm pretty sure comes from the inside belly of the cow. You can see it's showing fat wrinkles. Some would be strict and say that's bad leather selection during the clicking process, but that's almost certainly why it's placed on the inside quarter, uh, the least noticeable part of the boot. And what do you want to do? Throw away every wrinkle but probably a passable piece of leather? Apart from being costly, frankly I think it's a waste of a natural material, and anyway, don't you think the variations caused by the fat wrinkles are actually quite attractive? So, on to leather care. 
Because it's so new, I can't find a definitive guide to caring for double shot. Truman Boots do have a web page on caring for double shot which says to use their leather protector or leather cream to condition double shot. And you can do that, I'm sure. But since almost every page in their leather care guide says to use the same things, <laughs> I, I'm not sure that's especially tailored for double shot. So, as my maths teacher used to say, let's go back to first principles. We know it's hot stuffed pull-up leather, like Chrome Excel. It feels waxy and oily right out of the box. We also know it's a more rugged finish because it's clearly uncorrected, full grain, less evenly smooth and less potential for a shine. So based on that, I think I have two candidates for conditioning this leather. The first is my go-to for all smooth leathers, one that works well with Chrome Excel, and that is of course Venetian Shoe Cream. I think that would be a safe bet. The other product I'm thinking of is some type of waxy balm or leather dressing. One of my favorites, because I know it works, is Phoebing's Aussie Leather Conditioner. It has a beeswax base and won't darken the leather and will give it a waterproofing coat as well. You can also use Big Four, I guess. Uh, that definitely won't darken this leather, but I'm not sure it absorbs as well as either the Venetian or the Aussie. So you may have to apply it more often than those two. I'll leave links to where you can get these products in the description below. I would not use mink oil or even neat's foot oil. I think those would be absorbed too deeply and really darken this leather. Uh, unless you want it darker or faster, of course, it's totally up to you. The important thing, because it is a rugged boot and you may wear it in more rugged conditions, is to keep it clean. Make sure you brush it regularly and often. A vigorous brushing in and of its own will move the infused waxes around and you'd be surprised at how brushing alone can give it a good luster, uh, repair scuffs and scratches, and actually build that patina. As for sizing, the Parker 602 last is perfect for my feet uh, at a half down from my true size. What I call my true size is a US 8.5 in D width as measured on a US Brannock device. Just a note for Aussies and UK viewers, UK size numbers are one number down from US, so an 8.5 is a 7.5 in the UK. Anyway, in almost all of my heritage style Goodyear welted or stitch down boots, I take an 8D coming down a half size from my Brannock measurement. Parkhurst has started offering wider widths, but when I bought these, they only had one width and you had to size up if you were wider. So uh, the 602 last is a combination last, starting narrower in the heels and opening to an E width in the forefoot. For me, this means that Parker's boots grip my heels very securely, are snug in the waist, so offer pretty good arch support. At the ball of the foot, where the last widens, and in the toes, I have room to feel that my toes are not scrimped together. This means that straight out of the box, uh, these fit my feet and felt comfortable, except for one issue. Out of all my Parkhurst boots, I have nine to date, only one was problematic in the breaking in thereof. These were the Richmonds in Gaucho Moose, which I think were made slightly narrower than my other Parkhurst pairs because the leather is so soft and stretchy. Uh, but even then, they loosened up within a week. These, however, also presented an issue. The celastic heel counter in the left boot had been cut or placed a little higher in the pocket. You can see. Uh, for the first couple of weeks, they cut into my Achilles tendon when I walked and flexed my ankle. When I couldn't walk that away, I got a hairdryer and heated the area to reactivate the celastic and then bent it back until it was flexed backwards a bit more. They're good now. While with the shank and narrow waist, I said arch support is good, I think it could be improved. I have reasonably low arches, not flat, but low, and I always appreciate a little extra support from the bottom. And these feel a little missing underneath, but I can't report tired feet after being in these all day, so maybe it's in my imagination. Taking a look at cost and value, these cost US $352 in February 2022. Uh, Parker's boots range from the mid 300s to the high 300s, depending on leather and makeup. New models have crept higher over the start of the pandemic to now, and I guess that's to be expected with longer supply chains and global rising costs due to the price of oil, rising interest rates and other factors. They sit in between the 300s of Red Wing Heritage models and the 400s of makes like uh, Oak Street Bootmakers and Truman. While we're not necessarily talking apples and apples, 
I think they sit well between these two price ranges. They are better made and with better materials than entry-level $200 Thursday boots. Uh, they are more individualistic and at least as well made as Red Wing Heritage models, maybe even with a little more care in the making. They are not as sturdy as Truman, and to be fair, I don't think you can compare them with any Pacific Northwest boot anyway. Frankly, I think Oak Street bootmakers are not worth the extra $100. I'd put them as a comparable to Parkhurst in build. Um, I guess the outlier we have to recognize is Grant Stone. Uh, Grant Stone are really well made and at the same price, while more refined and uh, not aiming for the rugged market, I personally think that they're worth more than their listed mid $300 price range and they're the outlier probably because of cheaper manufacturing unit costs. All in all, I think these are fairly priced at the mid to high 300s in today's market. So there you go guys, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed my review of these Parkhurst boots. They're Richmond boots in Seidel's double shot leather in the light natural colorway or, or lack of colorway. If you enjoyed this video, you know what to do. Click on the like and subscribe buttons, please. I'm planning some really cool stuff coming up. Uh, Ellen Edmonds, more Thursdays, more RM Williams, and a boot and brand comparison or two. Don't miss them. Click on subscribe. Until then, take care guys, and I'll see you soon.